about what little I know. And uh, I would ask God's blessing upon this house, upon this family. They prosper and walk in hell. And be very dedicated. They're very dedicated to God. I apologize to you. I wish you could have heard me uh, 30 years ago. Uh, 30 years ago, I had all the answers. <laughs> Today, I have a, a few answers, but do I have a greater conviction? And I live by that conviction. Those, con those convictions guide me and convict me, judge me, guide me all along. And it's a privilege to be here. I listened as you sang. And uh, you know, I believe everything you said that you were singing. I really do. I, I am excited about what's ahead for the church. Last week I was uh, playing golf with a Well, he's successful at most everything. <laughs> uh, what fair. <laughs> I, I was playing golf with another Christian lad, a Christian leader. And he asked me, we we have a we were having we were having a lot of dialogue. We're, we're playing golf and he asked me basically about the church. And I said, this is my hope. I produce, most of y'all are under 30, aren't you? All of them under 30? You and the generations that are following you are my hope. I don't mean to be negative about this, but I've given up on my generation. I come from the baby boomer generation. We don't even talk about us anymore, and that's good. Mm -hmm. We've become a a pretty insignificant group of people, in my opinion. Uh, we're selfish. My generation is selfish, self-centered, greedy, shallow. No, that pretty much describes it. Uh, they're, uh, they play around religiously. They, they bounce around from one thing to the next and have no concept of commitment form or fashion. Now, are there a few in my generation that that aren't like it? Yes, there are. But as a whole, I describe my generation of people. So I, I really uh, have a lot of hope for you all and your generation and the generations after you. Uh, I hope that you all pass anything that has ever been done for the kingdom of God. Pass it. Go past it. Dream, dream extravagant. Grab the word. Grab the word and 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 fill it full of helium and just let it get bigger and let it let it fly. Because I truly do believe everything you're saying tonight. I believe that. And I hope I hope that your generation can get on fire fast enough to convert my generation and minister to us. The church is in your hands. The church is in your hands. We'll bounce around tonight. We're just mainly going to read some scripture. We'll talk about them a little bit. But let me ask a couple of questions, though. Uh, I presume all of you are, are Christians. You're saved, right? Okay. Uh, we got any new got any newbies? Just I mean, the last five six months. Nobody, no newbies. Good. Okay. So, all right. Um, you know all these these young people, Kate. Uh, point out a bowl one to me. You know what? A bowl. One that's bowl. Say Kelly. Kelly? Your bowl? You really love Jesus? 
Stand. Would you would just take one minute, not more than a minute, and just tell me um, your salvation experience? My salvation experience? Yeah, we could say. Um, when I was little. Okay. Yeah. Is it fresh on your mind? Or do, you, do you remember it or something in the past? I remember it was with a donut man tape. Um. <laughs> 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 I like to think I've matured a lot since then. <laughs> Is that it? That's good. That's good. Uh, wouldn't you guys like to it? Just give me a less than a minute. Just put, give me a testimony. You can say, well, I, I believe you're a big guy. Me? Yeah. <laughs> King Schaefer. <laughs> um, I was born and raised in a uh, a church going family, and um, I kind of thought that uh, I went to a Christian high school too. So I kind of thought Christianity was just some sort of game that adults <laughs> played, as like Santa or the Easter Bunny or something, and then. When I was That's 16, my generation. I mean, you affected you, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when I was 16, I was on a, a church spring break trip called Bible and Beach. Bible and Beach. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> Bible and Beach. And um, the Lord really spoke to me and revealed His existence to me in a powerful way. And I was convicted and knew that um, this wasn't just some game. It was, it was the real thing, and I needed to I needed to hop on board. So. Okay, good, good, good. Kate, would you just, do you mind doing it, please? Sure. Um, I grew up in a pretty <coughs> a good family, but a pretty secular family. Um, I started going to church on my own in, in high school. My parents ended up joining, but uh, my relationship with God was pretty shallow, pretty selfish. Uh, was pretty seeker sensitive, uh, sensitive to my own um, wants. Um, <clears throat> I came to college, my sophomore year in college, I uh, got connected with this group, the church, and uh, I got connected with this group because I saw a group of people um, that were my age that uh, not only said that they loved God, but their lives were really different. Um, and so for me it was a process after that of seeing who God is through the way people love one another and lay their lives down and I saw Jesus in that and um, gradually was called uh, to do the same Would y'all like to hear one more? That was pretty good aren't you? One more? Sure. Right, Billy how about you? <clears throat> I was five years old and we had a lady evangelist, a lady child evangelist, and she preached the gospel. And this little girl I couldn't stand named Kathy went up, and she was blubbering and crying, and everybody was all around her. And I went over in another corner, and I realized that God was my father, and that Jesus was his son, and had died for me, and I was captured by the fatherhood of God and his love uh, of sending his son. And that's as clear today as it was. I was wearing a, I was wearing a pair of pants that were exactly this color. <laughs> and when I went back and sat down on the pew, I looked down and it was spotted with tears. Mm -hmm. I was warmed inside and uh, I've walked with my father ever since. Now I would only add uh, just a, one statement to what Billy just said about himself because I asked him to it several years ago. Billy has never backslid. Never backslid in over 50 years. I've sinned. I wish you hadn't ruined the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Things are going so well. <laughs> now, what I did for you is I gave you a, an opportunity to really uh, practice something. Because there is a good opportunity, there's a good chance that
that you're going to run into some people and that, what, what we just did, that's as long as you're going to have. Mm -hmm. They'll cut you off after a minute. And so, you know, that puts a whole lot of pressure on you. A whole lot of pressure. That means you don't have time to, to just ramble around and bloviate and, you know, carry on. I mean, you've got to get right to the point, speak it, and, and, you know, allow God to start working. If you get two minutes, great. If you get an hour, that's, that's fabulous. But learn how to be precise and right to the point. That is critical. That is critical. So many people, so many people have lost the joy of that moment they stepped in the kingdom. Did you? Yeah, I listen to that, those words. I, 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 you know, I never get tired of Billy talking about his experience as a child. I, I wasn't a Christian growing up. I, I was, uh, I was, I was closer to hell for almost 23 years than anything else. I almost was there twice, three times, really. Very close to being killed. And so, I really appreciate salvation. I love to hear people talk about their experiences. That's all what we're going to talk about tonight. I'd like you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. You know, a few years ago I went to a, a, a church in another state. And it was a, a guy that pastors the church. That, you know, he's a national figure. and He's a good teacher. I enjoy listening to him. And, uh, my wife and I were on vacation. If I if I refer to Chris, that's my wife. Uh, we were on vacation, and so I went. I wanted to go hear this fellow preaching, and so we went to the church. It was a oh, just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful building. Uh, the parking was at the furthest. Oh, the furthest from the door was just fabulous. We could close. I mean, you know. And see, I was told in seminary, the demographics, all this stuff, that, that you know, at 75%, at you've got to build a bigger building. At 75%, you've got to put more parking lot in. You know, and all these, all these things. And so we, my wife and I would pull up into the, into the lot. You know, we we're about 20 minutes before the service. And we get out, we lock the door. And all of a sudden, we, we hear these brakes lock up, and here's a golf cart has pulled up, you know, and it's got like four seats and covers on it, you know, and, and this, this guy is smiling, good morning, brother and sister, you know, and, and he says, let me give you a ride to the door. <laughs> and we, we, I said, I mean, we're here, maybe just the sidewalk across the street. And, and I, I said, well, we'll just walk, no, 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 we want, we, we want to honor you today, and, you know, We got in, and <clears throat> he takes us right up to the door. We get there, and those two people open the door, and, he, and, and you know, they're, they're, they're hugging on us. Good morning. We're so glad to see you. You're such a blessing to us, you know. These people didn't know me from John Adams. <laughs> <laughs> How could I think you know I was a blessing or not, you know? I could have been one of the most despicable human beings ever lived. You know. But anyway, we go in and then there's somebody gets us on the inside. And, you know, they want to know how close you want to sit. And you, want, you know, they go down and, and, and they tape everything. And so, you know, you really was almost like a refrigerator in there. And they've got, they've got these velvet quilts over the backs of their pews, you know. And, and they tell you, if you don't have a Bible of your own, we've got one here for you, you know. Oh, they're just, they're just unbelievable. Just, it, the only, it ended when we got in our car to leave. And I thought, you know, all this is really nice. But this is not what it's about. This is not what it's about. Because I've heard, I've heard of, of churches in communist countries that met in the woods that you'd have to walk 
I heard as much as two hours in to find the service. And they wouldn't even tell you where the service was. You had to pray to find it. <laughs> <laughs> no golf cart? And everybody showed up. They got there. They found their way. Isn't that a whole different level of being filled with the Spirit? Uh -huh. I heard a I heard a great great uh, preacher that I got to know seven years ago. We were having we were having uh, breakfast with another group of ministers, and I saw him look across the table at another pastor, and he said, he looked at this man, and he said, "Do you understand the importance of when you stand in the pulpit every Sunday?" morning? that the destiny of men and women's lives are in your hands? Talk about bringing you down to earth. That'll bring you down to earth. The destiny of men and women's lives, the eternal destiny of their life, is in your hands. Effectively. Whoa. All right. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now, I am smart enough to tell you that that, that verse right there, verse 13, you're going to be, if you, if you are aggressive and passionate for God, you will be working on that the rest of your life. The rest of your life. The rest of your life. Maturity. <coughs> Uh, at the beginning of the year, God gave me three words. Now, you know, I was thinking about this this afternoon. God does this all the time. He, he just gives me a word. He'll just, you know, just a word. That's it. Not a word. It's a, a prophetic word. A word. Individual word. <laughs> but you know, he's never given me a definition. <laughs> I have to look that up by myself. <laughs> so, I start. Well, these three words have been really with me this year. The first word he gave me was the word excellence. Excellence. That word means uh, just, you know, quite simply, Beyond measure, very good, surpassing. There's no competitiveness in that. This is a passion of, of, of the individual's heart that says, I need to be the absolute best I can be. All the time. All the time. Excellence. Excellence. I, I worked. I worked in a pawn shop one time, just helping a guy out, and and they would refer to diamonds. You know, I mean, sometimes they actually referred to some diamonds as just junk diamonds, because they had so much carbon and and flaws and things in them. And they, the diamonds are, 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 are ranked, you know. And I, I don't know what the top is. When that, the top are, I, the what best we ever had was, I think, what they called VS diamonds, you know. And they were, but, you know, they, they still had some little flaws in them, but they were the best of the best that we were getting. And see, we've become, we've become like that. I, I, a while I was there, I studied the process of gold. And, and how gold is, how they, they work with it, how they manufacture it. And, and they just, they, when they start processing it, you know, just all it is is just, it, it's inter, intermixed with, with rocks. And then they, they start applying all this heat to it. 
and, the, and some of the rocks just break away from it, and then, and then the more heat that's applied to it, the more the more the impurities come out of it, and they skim those off. They keep the heat up, and they skim more, and and pretty soon they come out of what's just pure gold. But it's after a season, after a period of time. Excellence. See, I believe that God, out of my life and your life, so I'm going to speak, you know, very, you know, just very pointed to you. I'll, I'll, I'll say you, if you don't mind that. Uh, God wants you to walk in excellence. Now, if you've had the privilege of being around someone that knows how to to acquire excellence and how to put, you know to work and, and gain excellence and, and work strive toward it, you know you've got a real real heads up. Most people I run into, they don't. Most people are just getting by. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. See, you know what most people want out of church? Hey, brother, I'm here to drive you to the door. <laughs> oh, come on, get in my cart here. You know, I don't want you, I don't want you walking 150 yards. Oh, you're so, you're so, you're such a blessing to us. most people want. They want to be, they want the doors open from, and so they can and be ushered down. We want to sit in the in the center section, four rows from the from, from the pulpit area, you know, right in the center. Oh yeah. If you yeah would you mind putting a cover over my lap? <laughs> Chili. <laughs> Hey, I've been in this business 36 years. I've been in it 36 years. Most people aren't looking for excellence. They're looking for mediocrity at the best. Uh -huh. Amen. At the best. Mediocrity. You know, well, I, don't, I don't want to get too far out in front of the people. Well, my gracious, I might condemn somebody. I might, they might come under conviction. They might feel bad about themselves. Uh-huh. I heard I heard some a, a, a Christian leader talking to one of their people on the phone here a couple of months ago, and this person and, and the person said, "Oh, you're just wonderful. I haven't met a wonderful person yet. <laughs> <laughs> I really haven't. I, every time every time I run into somebody, I think they're wonderful. You know, so they mess it up. <laughs> but we're still friends. We're still friends." See, it's, it's not having the flaws. What the problem is, is not doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the flaw. That's the bad mistake. So God wants excellence out there. Another, there was a, another word he gave me. And it's the word humility. You know, until about a year and a half ago, I, 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 now I've, been, I've been to seminary. And please don't judge me by that. But you know, I didn't know what humility was. I looked here and I looked there. And, you know, and I'd find a, somewhat of a definition here. And I really, this was one of those times I got to the point, I thought, now why can't God give me the definition? He gives me the word. It means, that means he wants me to know what it means. He wants me to not only know what it means, but he wants me to, to jump over that what James was talking about and be a doer of the word. And you know, if you talk to most people, you know, their whole ideal of, uh, of humility is being a milk toast, mealy mouth, you know, doormat for everybody that walks around. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> humility means willing to stoop to any measure that is needed mm -hmm. to please God. It, it has a picture in, 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 the, in the Greek. It has a picture of a person that has taken <clears throat> on a load. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a heavy load. 
It's a it's a strenuous load. It's a load that 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 that, that causes the body to pulsate <coughs> underneath of it. But it just keeps going. And it's 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 a picture of of a person that that even though the load may seem unbearable, that if if the owner comes up and says, "How about a little bit more?" You know, I want to tell you about a, a man's entrance into the ministry. Oh, everybody, you know, circles that Billy and I have been in and around. I mean, we've seen all kinds of things. And one of the things in circles we've been in, hey, people love visions. They want visions. And they want, generally, somebody to interpret that vision for them because they're not deep enough spiritually to do it themselves. Let me tell you about this vision. God spoke and said, I want you to go to town and there's a guy down there named Saul. I want you to talk to him for me. Wait a minute. I have heard about him. And he has come up here to do no good. God says, he is my appointed vessel. Now, everybody wants to be used by God, don't you? Then tell him what he must suffer for me. You know, I was reading along, and Paul was writing one of his letters, and, and he he spoke in this letter, and he and he called his things that he's like light affliction. I laid my Bible down and I thought, is the man crazy? <laughs> Light affliction? I knew, I've read the story of what, you know, beatings and whippings and stonings and, and snakes biting him and ships sinking out from under him and staying in the water, you know, for a couple of days. and Light affliction? But his whole, his whole call was just keep going forward, keep going forward. I mean, they got to a point one time, he was so passionate, and you understand, he, he, he talked to Jesus. And he said, he said, you know, and I believe he, I believe he had a heavenly experience too. So he knew what was there. He said at one point, he said, I'm so caught I really, really, I want to get out of here. I want to go. Then, you know, he was trying to tell, hey, this, this is not the pinnacle, folks. I know what the pinnacle is. I want to go there. But I'm willing to sacrifice it for a while longer for your benefit. For your benefit. Now, that's humility, folks. Not being mealy mouth, milk toast, door mad of the world. They just be back saying things to you. I mean, you know. Now you may say, well, what, what do you do when people talk to you like that? Don't pay attention to them. Only pay attention to what people say to you that have something worth saying. Uh -huh. You know. We're in, we're in a we're in this whole society today that, you know, I mean, you can't talk to one another if you, it, you know. Billy and I, our, our backgrounds are, you know, we've got some Cherokee Indian in us. You know, my grandfather was so, so humiliated to be a, have Cherokee blood in him, he would never own up to it. Because he grew up, they called him gut ears. Because they ate anything to survive. Well, can you imagine calling somebody a gut eater today? That you, you end up in court. It's not what people call you. It's not what people say. It's not even say about you. It's the value of what God thinks about you. That's who you are. 
Three words. Well, now, at this point, I'm going to tell you something. We're going to get back to the third word in a minute. What about this word maturity? Well, it simply means to be perfect or complete. I really love one definition I found. It mean, it said to me, it means to be ripe. You know, I don't know if you have any agricultural background, any of you, but when you when you grew up in the country, you grew up around in agriculture, you looked for things to get ripe. Because do you know until something was ripe, it was useless? I can tell you for a fact. I ate some apples one time that were not ripe. And they don't agree with you. Because they're not ready. And your body's not ready for them. So what's God saying to us? He's saying, I want you to be ripe. I want you to be complete. I want you to be perfect. I want you, you know, and, and understand, see, most people, they'll say, well, you know, you're talking about perfectionism. You know, no, a, a person that's a perfectionist, what they do is they line cans up in a line. That's a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about that. Mm -hmm. We're talking about people that walk in a lifestyle mm -hmm. that is just, Well, why be mature anyway? Well, let's go to Matthew 28. Well, I tell you what, you know, you folks have learned some things about, about, about praise. That is good tonight. Yeah, I, I have no musical ability. And I love to listen to people that really, that, can, that they don't sing to entertain people. They sing to worship God. I love to listen to that. Verse 18, Matthew 28, Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even at the end of the age. You know, that's... Uh, that takes a mature person to do that. Uh -huh. There's a lot of responsibility there. That's good. A lot of responsibility. When I was in seminary, I talked to several missionaries. They, they, they came through the Southern Seminary a lot. And, uh, and one day I was talking with the one we sat down and he was talking about how many people that apply to become foreign missionaries, they, just, they, they, throw, they don't ever, they don't give them a second thought. Because just by talking to them, they can tell that it's just, you know, something the spur of the moment, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, something that, you know, hey, that means you, you know, anybody else is doing, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. See, the thought process should be one with contemplation and some, and some logical input and some direction and some guidance. Go into all the world. It's powerful. This is powerful. You know, you don't hear many people preaching this passage anymore. You know. I mean, it's sort of like not going to all the world, but make sure next Sunday that you come back and we'll come and pick you up in the parking lot and bring you back in the church. <laughs> we won't you be comfortable here. We won't be able to count your head. You know. uh, turn over in your Bible to uh, Luke chapter 12. Well, now we're, 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 what we're doing here is we're looking at reasons to be mature. But there's got, to be a, there's got to be some real, real reason that God wants us to be mature. Look at verse uh, uh, 46. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him. 
And in an hour, he does not know. And cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. Mm -hmm. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of flogging will receive but a few. For everyone who has been given much, much be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. Well, that's a, that's, that, that takes a mature person to understand that. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're getting, get in, and, and believe me, if we're in a society that one of the, one of the words we have really, or the two words, there's two words, that we've really, really gotten down pat, it's give me, give me, give me. I don't have a problem with that. You just do something with it. You know. No, don't be like don't be like the man that's always buying tools, but every time his wife needs something done, she has to hire the handyman. Uh-huh. Turn, turn over in your Bible to uh, John's Gospel, chapter 14. Verse 12, Jesus is talking here. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he would do also. And greater works than these will he do as I go to the Father. Oh, I have preached that several times over the over these past 36 years. And all people get so excited, you know, and and, and I can I can talk about this passage because it's a passion in scripture for me. Because all of a sudden you begin to talk about, you know, in order to do this, you've got to have the authority that's been invested in you from, from on high. You've got to have the power that, that comes when the Holy Spirit indwells inside of you. And all of a sudden, you begin to you begin to look through the scripture. And, and when the John's disciples came and they said, Are you the one? And he said, Well, he said, Go back and tell him this. You hear the gospel preached, blind eyes are open, deaf ears are open, the dead are raised, the sick are healed. Go back and just report this back to them. And then you begin to associate those together. You say, wow, you mean that can happen? I can do those kind of things? Wow, yes you can. Well, there's a responsibility coming with all that telling. Because all of a sudden, you're beginning you're beginning to step over into Satan's territory. And you're beginning to do a, you're beginning to do some very damaging things. And when you go out there, especially, you start preaching the gospel, and men and women get saved, and they get they get set free, and, and, and they get out of the clutches of sin, and they begin to embrace, they embrace the kingdom of God to walk in. You are absolutely going to be in warfare like you've never experienced in your life. And you better be mature. You know, there's a, there's a line in the movie. It says, you know, that a stupid man. He brought a knife to a gunfight. And you don't want to be picking a knife to a gunfight. You want to be out there. You want to be loaded. And it takes a mature person. I said in spiritual warfare for one solid year. One solid year. Taught on it for four solid months after I studied it. And it's exciting. It's exciting. But several years ago, I learned something. I took martial arts. And I moved up the belt, up the ladder is pretty good. But I found out something in martial arts. All those little principles and all those little moves and everything that they teach you, you better learn them. Because you get in combat with somebody, and we would play with it. We, we called it playing. We get on the mat, play with each other. You get slapped upside the head. If you don't do the mechanics. And that's how spiritual warfare works. See, I really believe we win all the time. It takes a mature person. It takes a 
real mature person. While we're at it, while we're there, just jump over another chapter there in John's Gospel. Now, I understand we're talking about why well, you got to be mature. Jesus, in the first verse, said, I, I am the true vine, and my Father's a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. I have to confess, I do not pray that prayer every night, but it would be a good prayer every night that if I would get on my knees and or on my face before God and say, if there is anything in my life that is absolutely hindering me from producing more fruit, whatever it takes to get it out of there, do it. I've got six grandchildren. The, uh, the youngest is going to go to the first grade this year. And she's got this little blanket. It's really not a blanket. It's a rag. It used to be a blanket. It's a rag now. It's just worn out, you know. I mean, it's, a, it's a, the nastiest, ugliest, uh, most despicable little thing you can think of. And any time, any time that she's upset... She grabs that thing, I forget what she calls it, some crazy name, but she, she grabs that thing up and she wraps it around her arm and her hand and it's got all kinds of holes, so it's not like she has trouble finding one, and she sticks her thumb through one of the holes and sticks her thumb in her mouth and she, can you imagine what this looks like? <laughs> you know, I've seen that on Sunday mornings. Uh-huh. On Wednesday nights, too. See, because she's not mature, her mom for the last year has been trying to get that, that thing away from her. I don't believe it's healthy because it's so nasty. <laughs> <laughs> you can't wash it and make it sanitary. That's how bad it is. But take that thing away. One time, she misplaced it. You've never heard anything like that. It was just unbelievable. I mean, the world was falling apart. Now, see, we sit here and say, and, it, and it's just that little old silly blanket. You know, we'll get her another one, you know. No, no. I've got to have my blanket. I've got to have mine because that's what makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is a fact. Maybe after I'm gone, you know, y'all sit down and talk to Billy about this. But, you know, but I, I think maybe we get to a point in our lives, our, our walk with, with God, and maybe it's what makes us feel good causes us to slow down in our fruit, fruit production. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I don't know. 30 years ago, I had the answer to that. I don't have it today. But I'm just thinking, folks, out loud with you. Maturity. Well, let's look down at 2 Timothy. We'll move from something that's a little less mundane. Why the necessity for maturity? 2 Timothy 3, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of God, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Now, at that point, 
I won't stop. Because every Christian, you know, y'all are y'all on fire for Jesus and you're excited about the Lord and everything. But there comes a time in your life you've got to absolutely sell out. I mean, you just totally sell out. And, you just, and you, that means that what this book says, what God is speaking to me in this book, I'm going to do it. Uh-huh. Amen. Avoid such men as these. Avoid such men as these. 